about your history, your okay. brief history. My background is I taught finishing at Western in Kalamazoo. And I've done a lot of stuff with automotive where we did the walnut, or actually for old dashboards for Mercedes and also for Buick. And I had to go to Germany to transfer the plant. There's on Seven Mile Alpine, it's called Bayer, B-H-R, near the, there's a Buick dealership on the corner of Alpine and Andrew plant next to it so we transferred that finishing is critical and knowing what your materials is and what are you trying to do there's no one perfect finish right okay if you're going to do stuff for automotive use a polyester that's what they put on the Stanway pianos but if you're going to have it for other type of thing uh, polyurethane people use and a lot of people use a pre-catalyzed or a catalyzed there's actually three lacquers so but I want to open it up if there's any questions on that we can move wherever direction that you might have what are you trying to finish and what are you trying to do um, preferred is sprayed. Let's know. say, uh, let's say you had a. You've got. Oh, yeah. You're going to have to have a filler on this one because you've got MDF. Right. So you've got an MDF. Mm -hmm. Yep. You've and got a sealer. So how would you go about. You definitely have to have a really good sealer. That one I would probably, if you're doing pre catalyzed lacquer, I'd have two coats of sealer before I go ahead and put a. You what can put sealer? a paper. It's a lacquer sealer. Okay. It's a lacquer sealer. Polyurethane doesn't have a sealer. It's itself. You right. just dilute it. The poly, uh, uh, the actual lacquer stuff, two coats on anything that's porous. Part of the board is one of the worst to finish. Mm -hmm. A lot of people will put aviation paint, which is really expensive to cover up the pores. Mm -hmm. Howard Miller does it. The that's the key is is sanding. Make sure it's all sanded. Your seams are level and flush. You have to put a filler in. There's a paste filler with regards to it. A variety of stuff and then re sand it's almost like an auto body yeah when you see the auto body they're putting and i've used actually uh, i uh, actually bondo on some things some of my wood joints i did an 18th century harpsichord and there's certain lock joints that you have to have as it comes around because it's eight foot and you get some blemishes and bondo is one of the things but i, I, I don't recommend it because it's like cars it can be one of those things but the sealing on that, you probably got two coats, maybe three coats of sealer. Every coat, whatever finish you are doing, sand between coats. It's called scuff sand. If it's polyurethane, 280 grit. Yep. If it's lacquer, 320. There's a thicker fill property on the polyurethane, so you can have a more coarse abrasive. Mm -hmm. Lacquer is thinner, it's more of a quick evaporation on that, so you have a thinner thing you can cut through. And that's one thing is, is you're going to seal this, and a lot of people might say, yeah, I'm going to put two coats of sealer. It comes in colors, but also typically it's a clear. And then you can go to a opaque finish. You know, you want an orange, purple, green, whatever, and put your coats on. But the key thing is, is the prepping. Just like your cars, everybody has to have them primed, and what are they after the prime? They get them scuff sanded. That's to make sure there's tooth, to hang the paint, hang the whatever you want, so that it doesn't peel off. A couple of years ago, in the early 90s, you probably saw GM Ford Chrysler had a recall and there were certain pickup trucks, certain blue, there was a black, there was another color. <coughs> they had a contaminant, it was Imron paint. And there was something in the factory that had contaminated the paint, of course, to the paint line. And it just peeled off like sheets, it's like freckles. Oh, I can see the galvanized steel, but how come it's not hanging there? Right. They have a bond thing. And a lot of the new things with Ford, it's going to be interesting to see because Ford just recently released uh, the 150 pickup, the aluminum. If you work with aluminum, anybody knows you have to etch the metal. It won't bond if you just grab aluminum, wipe it down, and then just go ahead and spray. You have to have little, you know, almost like saute marks into that metal so that the paint will hang on. Because it will blow off. And I'm think, you think about it, when you go to our car washes, we're using high velocity of water if it's not. And I've had some people that said, oh, I took it to a body shop, and guess what? They didn't prep the paint right. And all of a sudden, they blew a hole through the paint. There's just raw metal. So preparation is really important. Uh, tap rags, if you're using the polyurethane. Lacquer, the benefit is it dries fairly fast, but it only lays in the surface. If you're using polyurethane for like particle MDF or any other type of material, it will actually drink into the wood about a quarter of an inch. And it works really well. It's a big anchor. Thing is, lacquer does not like polyurethane. Polyurethane does not like lacquer. They do not like each other, and you really have to neutralize it. Let's say you have an old piece of furniture that had polyurethane on it. You've got to get it all off. And one of the things I always tell people, wipe the thing down with naphtha. But naphtha is one of those key things that's used in the dry cleaner for getting stains out. But what is naphtha? It's lighter fluid. 
you don't want to burn your house down, so you get a jiff jar, you get something that when you're done with the rag, it gets in, you seal the top on, and then you put it outside. But I use naphtha for a lot of stuff. If I don't know, you know, if it's a piece of furniture and it might have been 100 years old, <coughs> I want to neutralize it, I want to make sure it bites it. But something like that, I probably have at least two, maybe three coats of the lacquer, thin stuff sand between coats, and then go to an opaque finish if that's what you want, or if you want to do some other special effects. So stuff with a block, or? Nope, just, just with your hands, yeah, just right. like that. What it is, people don't realize that whenever you finish raw material, especially wood, <coughs> as soon as it gets its first contact with some type of liquid, the hairs of the fibers want to stick up. Yep. And you want to mow the lawn and knock it off. And that's the key thing. And the first coat, too, depending on how the wood's stored, be it plywood, particle board, or regular hardwoods or, or, or softwoods, it reacts differently because it's been dried out. And over here, it's nice and glossy. Over here, it's dull and there's fibers sticking up. That's why I'm going to scuff sand it. And it's just, it's not biting in. Because think about it, if you're staining something, you go in there, you're going to rip that stain right off. You don't want to do that. You want to keep whatever coloration you got and lightly scuff sand it. After you scuff sand it, you can dust it off. Well, the fortunate thing with lacquer, it will melt itself. All coats become one coat. <laughs> Polyurethane, every coat is an individual. There's no two coats alike. If you burn through one coat to the next, you'll have a ring. The only thing you can do to correct that, put another coat on. So it's, and the benefit is you can use polyurethane on the floor but it takes 24 hours to dry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can buy the cheap Minwax that's four to six hours old set up, but that's just a thin body material that has a lot of thinner in it to sell it. Oh yeah, you can get it, you know, and you recoat, but anytime I do polyurethane, 24 hours. Any oil stains, if you're gonna stain it, some fancy wood grain overnight. One of the key things I do, if you're gonna really, really make it look right, and it's, let's say, a wood grain, let's say it's, rosewood or some type of grain that's really expensive. I always use, uh, my simple trick to pop the grain is Watco Danish oil natural. Watco will go in and it will give her iridescent. I'll have people get a <coughs> walnut. They go, oh my God, my walnut board doesn't look like you and it's cut right on the same slab of the tree. How come yours has 3D and I don't have that? The Watco Danish oil, but again, it's an extra step. It's overnight drying, but boy, it's worth the value. What do you think about sure. why the Danish oil versus boiled linseed oil? Well, boiled linseed oil is nothing but the main ingredient for paint. It does okay. I, I, I have a harder time to dry out the boiled linseed oil. Yep. Uh, but I still, if, if I do not get the drying effect of the Watco or the boiled, I'll quickly give a slight bath of naphtha to accelerate and actually cause it to dry off. So the key thing is, is you don't want the oil still wet when you're putting a film right, on Right, exactly. You, you want to peel it off like uh, yeah. saran wrap. Saran wraps are really, you know, people, oh, I, I did that five minutes ago. Well, guess what? You're going to have a real hard time. So I've never used the Danish oil. Does that darken the wood like boiled linseed oil? It gives oil? a little bit. It, it's the equivalent of boiled linseed oil. Okay. If you have boiled linseed oil, you can get by. They call it sometimes wood oil bead. Yep. Just right. But make sure, and this is one thing i got to be in fact about, do not buy raw linseed oil. Right. Huge difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anybody know what raw linseed oil does and why is it used? Mm. Raw linseed oil, raw linseed oil, I feel like a month, I can't get the mountain, will never dry. It will always be wet and gummy. In the industry, they need it specifically for the steel industry because you see those spools of steels going down the road. They want it so that, one, it's a lubricant for the stamping press. Mm -hmm. But once they got the shell of the car built, they run it through a bath to neutralize that raw linseed oil. But don't introduce that to your shop by grabbing, oh, I bought raw linseed oil. Make sure it's wood. Uh, if you have boiled linseed oil, go ahead and use it. The Watco I use for a lot of my repairs and touch-ups and things on that sort, and it does a really, really good job. I've been using that since 79, and it's one of those things that, boy, if you want to do a, a really spectacular, if it's got green that you really want to show the green, Instead of an opaque, meaning one color, I want red or I want purple or whatever. But uh, oil is is the main ingredient for paint. Yeah. It's always that creamy stuff before all of a sudden your pigments start mixing in. Oh, okay, it's yellow. Oh, it's orange. So.
So, so just wipe on the Danish oil, leave it overnight. Wipe it on and then wipe off. I let it drink in about two or three minutes and just wipe oh, off the yeah, excess. Off. Just so it's not gummy or stuff. And then the yeah. next morning or whenever it is, check it to see that it's pretty well dry. If it's not, then I'll just actually put a little bit of naphtha and just wipe it down. Naphtha is a wonderful, wonderful uh, quick check. If you think your product is ready to get into the finishing, wipe it down with naphtha. It will show any defects, any nicks, scratches. You want to make sure. What are you doing with a lot of clear coats? You're magnifying whatever flaws are on that table. You've got a magnifying glass on it. So you do not want to have that happen. You want to make sure. I mean, if you're buying a Gibson guitar, it better be polished that it's, it's reflecting like, like a floodlight back at you. And this German company that we did the dashboards, that was their main thing. A lot of their equipment came from Gibson. And the, the big thing is, is you're polishing any flaw and you're magnifying it that much more. So the naphtha will quickly give you a quick read as to what the wood looks like. Oh, there's a scratch here. Oh, guess what? I got a glue spot. I had glued that up and put a little thumbprint. You know any glue will not absorb any stain or any coloration is going to give a, a, a flaw. You've got to make sure we neutralize it. So it's a quick check and it will not corrupt the surface of the wood or whatever you're working with. It basically will say, this is what the film coat will look like. Am I ready? Because if you've ever done any finishing and you're staining something, you go, Oh, shoot, there's a flaw here. And you get out the sandpaper and you start sanding, and all of a sudden that stain gets gummed up. And now you got an irregular stain pattern. And a lot of the industries, they'll do a shade stain with a spray. What, uh, the naphtha, what's the difference between using that versus warm water? Do you ever just, because I've raised the. Well, if you're doing water base, if you're doing water base, you're going to pre grain raise it because a lot of the water grains or yep. water stains have an agent which you want to, and again, you don't use regular water, you use distilled water. Because regular tap water has minerals in it and you can get blue stains or blue marks and all of a sudden, what happened here? It's speckled over here. So that's a key thing. Yeah, if you're doing any water base, make sure you're using distilled water. Pre grain raise it the night before, then you have to scuff sand it. Blow it off if you have a compressor or run it down with a tack rag or, you know, just make sure that the fibers doesn't have any gravel or any dust that might make it a little bit. Because what you're trying to do is you're not you're not trying to obscure the grain, you're trying to reflect the grain to give it its detail. If that's what you're trying to do if it's a wood grain. If it's paint, you still don't want to have it where you've got some cosmetic flaw. Because you're going to be magnifying it by the fact that the paint will even transfer. Oh, there's a knot there. You didn't fill that in. So it's a really critical thing to take your time and prep. A lot of people, when I get in, my, for my background at Western, when I taught a finishing class, six hours a week, 15 weeks and you have to make 24 panels you have to do all kinds of special effects from fly specking to glazing to whatever it could be automotive when we do wrinkle finish basically you're baking the part and you wrinkle it or it might have the peen finish or flocked the old fuzzy stuff the old coloring books where it feels like velvet we would do that flocking and that but the key thing about finishing is don't rush it it's a detail upon itself what makes or breaks is the final thing, the finish. You can do really good craftsman of the cabinet, but if it's not finished well, garbage in is garbage out. Question on the MDF, and Matt was asking about it. On the seams, and every one of us here has seen it, you'll paint something, looks perfectly good for a month, and six months later, you can see every seam in that cabinet. Check, that the, yeah. Check your relative humidity or if you replace it. You still have a high moisture in Michigan tends to have that. I tend to, if I'm doing something with the seam thing, I tend to do it more in the winter time because your heating system's on and it's very dry. That's when your hands crack out. I tend to avoid it in the summer because I have people turn around and they dump furniture off on me in the summertime. I go, I don't refinish in the summer because relative humidity is a pain, especially water-based and spirit-based. I use a lot of spirit-based. People go, that's not environmentally friendly. But I'm looking for durability and I'm also looking for that antique that's 80, 100 years old. That's how they did it. These water bases, when you have the high humidity day, that's moisture out there that you cannot regulate. Your, your curing time, it's actually uh, dissolving the actual viscosity of the material. So I still stay with spirit base. But the problem is with high humid days, you can't see it, but it's in the atmosphere. And if you spray finish, you don't have as much on a steel coat if you have to be spraying with lacquer or polyurethane. Polyurethane is just diluted. I call it a wash coat. You can maybe 40% thinner to about 60% polyurethane my first coat. 
Because the key thing is I don't want to have a huge coat of polyurethane and I have a lot of hairs that want to stick up. Well, the first time I scuff sanded, I got to knock that off. And if it's really coated in a heavy goo, almost like molasses, it's hard to sand that out. Plus, it will show up as kind of a flaw, like a oozing sore or not that's oozing juice out of it. You don't want to have that happen. And the thing is, is making sure we're not trapping the moisture, the relative humidity that's around here. When you get that film coat, it hits the surface. If it's a real high humid day, it looked clear and all of a sudden it goes foggy and it doesn't show the detail. Haze. It's got a haze. And the only thing is, is you've got to add a, actually a butylate into the thing, a retarder into your mixture to counteract that. But it actually weakens your finish. And I have it where I said, I don't refinish in the summertime. I just tell them, hey, you know how hot and humid it is? It's like Florida. We're not doing finishing today. <coughs> the only way you can counteract that, but it's expensive, have an air-conditioned spray booth. But that's counterproductive because what do you have? A fan blowing all the air out of the room. And a fan blowing air in. Yeah. <laughs> so it's crazy. Yeah, because of the air conditioning. Do you use, so. use desiccant canisters on your spray or? I, I have on run some stuff that I haven't used in a while, but it, it's some people are really into that, and other people it's like, eh, I haven't really had a problem. I kind of pick the day. There's certain days I can't spray, and there's other days I will. I've had people bitch at me over the phone saying, I need that table. I said, I told you, winter time is best in Michigan. Or, you know, fall or spring, but not in the summer. I don't like doing any type of spirit base and things on that sort, even water base. Because water base is harder to regulate because it's water to begin with, and then you've got water floating around you can't see. And the key thing is, is once you spray, you get this fog effect. We've all had a class in science, probably third or fourth grade, two clear liquids, you put them together and all of a sudden it causes a precipitate, mm -hmm. like a foggy morning. Well, that's what you're doing and then you can't hardly get that fog out of there. Other than if you have to spray a small butylate over it to soften the surface, to let the moisture out because it's trapped inside. It's between the, t the surface of the wood or the first coat or the first coat to the second coat to the third. And you can magnify it and then you can muddy the whole thing. The only thing you can do is strip it and redo it again. So are you using low pressure when you're shooting yeah. water-based lacquers? HVLP, yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, what, do watch out with the water-based HVLP. It tends to pit most of the guns quicker. So, I was going to ask you one other thing, too. Some of my equipment, <laughs> I know the stuff's set up right. Is that too much moisture, even for the water base, maybe getting through? Yeah. And you got to clean your gun. And the other thing is, if you're doing water base, one thing I, I can't say enough. Make sure you get a wet rag. If you're going to take a 15 minute break, put the gun down and put the wet rag over the nozzle, the little air fittings and everything else. Because what's going to happen with water base, it's going to actually dry out and it's going to write down the fluid tube and enter anything else, and you got to clean the gun. Now That's your, one of the hassles. On your gun, your sprayer head, three, five, whole millimeter size. Anything? I'm using doing two. Okay. I'm using an Ehrlich. Um, yeah, Ehrlich's, uh, it's kind of, they came out of left field for years. Which which Ehrlich's are you using? It's the 5500 now, I think it's about 6000 or something. It's about $300. Nice. Yeah, that's the one that would It's the blue, yeah, it's the Woodcraft yeah. one. It, and the funny thing before that, I have a 350th gun, and I have three of the Dovis, the expensive ones. One came in from England. I was doing an 18th century harpsichord. I made it. I wanted it authentic, the original ones in Scotland, and I saw one in Scotland, and I wanted to make sure. And I used, uh, actually, it's kind of funny, it seems everybody said, you're making this for Liberace, it's salmon pink, but harpsichords are gaudy. They didn't have floodlights in the 16 and 1700s, so they painted outrageous colors. Oh, there it is, there it is, that's the color. And it's all gold leaf. And the big thing was, I did, I did my first two coats, I did it by brush, and then I hand sanded it. And I actually tinted the paint to the color of what I'm trying to go. Then I switched over and did a spray coat. But I made sure each coat I did the proper scuff sand. And some people just want to breeze right through that. Mm -hmm. You can't. <clears throat> the one thing too in your shop is have proper lighting. You now see the well, county cars and some of the other shows where they have the lights all over the place. You drive a car in, they got lights all over the place. That's to make sure you don't have a blind spot. If you can get daylight too, can't say not for daylight because yeah, like you get a color shift, get a Macbeth light, so you can compare it to whatever. Because we had to do it with the dashboard. We had a certain prescribed color that GM accepted, 
under the Macbeth light, this is acceptable, this is not. And it was a walnut burl dashboard. And the dashboard had three pieces. If you screwed up the glove box, the whole thing was thrown away because it was all matched pattern. Mm -hmm. And to get the color right, we had to bleach the walnut, let it dry, neutralize it with vinegar, because that's one of the key things. You want to get that residue of bleach, because you know how you smell your hand? The whole day that bleach is on your hand. Those are the little crystals from the bleach. We had to neutralize it, let it dry for about a week, and then introduce a sap stain and a hardwood stain, and then start building the polyester foam coat. But we also had to have a lock-in for UV inhibitor, ultraviolet rays. So that's another prescribed thing. Is it going to be a lot near sunlight? Do you not want to have a color shift? And what's the warranty on the brand name that you're working with? <coughs> Most of my clear finishes, I'm using Velspar. And a lot of people don't know that. Velspar was a little company in the 80s and 90s out of Minnesota. Came to Grand Rapids and gobbled the big giant uh, Garstman Chemical. They got the recipes for all the furniture stuff. And if you see Velspar now, I saw a lot of the shows, you'll see Velspar on their jackets or Gas Monkey, the guys got Velspar mm -hmm. t-shirts and stuff like that. The recipes came from Grand Rapids. So the little guppy swallowed the whale to get the recipes because of the furniture industry. Now they jump to automotive. You know, yeah, one more on wood. When you go with the iron woods and rose woods and shellacs, I keep having oil leach out. What I actually would do is give a good bath, and if you're using like a lacquer, I would give a light bath of acetone, real small, so you can actually pull out the oils and dry it out. Because yes, that bleeding, you don't want that bleeding effect. Because it looks like a flaw or you drop some on it when you were in the finishing process. Acetone, but watch out, acetone is the solvent to lacquer. Mm -hmm. So you can only do it in raw wood tissue, but if you're on your first coat of lacquer and you whip out the acetone, you're stripping. <laughs> now you've comp yeah, compounded it. And I also Zero. tell people, when you finish and you have a run dripper error, let it dry. Don't worry about it. First thing people want to do is get a rag or use their thumb. Let it cure out and scrape it with, just I use the um, utility knife. You use that as a scraper, lock off the top of it. You're knocking off the volcano top, you're going to have it just level. Then scuff sand and put another coat, and you're okay. Because I've had students that you've been spraying for how many years? Since 1971? You got a couple run strips. I said, I don't mind. I said, that was done with shellac. Shellac, shellac is real thin body, it's like water. And I had an open heart doctor who was doing a, a old clock and he wanted to have it done in shellac. I said, the final coat, we're going to do it in pre catalyzed lacquer and lock it in because shellac, if it gets spilled with alcohol or something like that, denatured alcohol, it will dissolve that. You don't want it dissolving or powdering out on you. <coughs> so that's a key thing that people, but yes, you do that with a lot of oily woods. I know I said, I'm sorry. Go uh, I finished, I did just shellac. Um, Sort of a French polish, but not quite. But it, between winter and summer, I can I can see it yep. kind of shrink and come back. Like it, it, yep. it's kind of bumpy in the. Uh, I think it's in the summer. It, it, there can I be don't a remember, but whatever it is, it's one time it's perfectly smooth, and then yep. the next season. Oh, it's it, irritating. It's like your skin so. can be, you know, really coarse from dried out. Thing. The one thing I want to say on shellac: shellac is never going to go out a season. It's used everywhere real good insulator motors, they use shellac. If you have a pill that never catches your throat, guess what, it's coated in shellac. Time Magazine, why does Time Magazine or any of the magazines don't fade? You put a newspaper outside, all the the rays, it fades, doesn't it? Shellac is really compatible. Shellac can be under polyurethane, it can be under lacquer. It's kind of a bridge to anything. Yeah, it, 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 it sets a flexibility. So, and the benefit of shellac is it's got that versatility. The only downside of shellac is it has a short shelf life. That's why a lot of people buy the granule crystals. And they'll, and they'll put it in overnight in the flakes and they'll let it dissolve and then you decay in a pit. You make what you need because the key thing, and I had this happen as a high school student, I was doing a thing for competition. And so, so there's some shellac over there. And I knew shellac was good, but I didn't realize, I didn't check the label. Shellac is probably only good for 60 to 90 days you open up a can, only buy what you need. Do not think that you're going to have it on the shelf for a year or two. Because what will happen, if you've opened that can within 60 to 90 days, the denatured alcohol is going to go out in the atmosphere. And guess what? You'll put it on and it will never dry. A month later, it's still sticky. I was doing that. I had this stupid thing. I said, damn, the thing won't dry. So he says, oh, that was the old batch of shellac. Nobody told me. 
I'm 16, 17, and I'm trying to get my project done, and it's as sticky as could be. So I learned that way. So shellac, buy what you need if you get it in a can, put a date on it. And when it's ever you open the first time that can, the clock is ticking. Don't the flakes have a shelf life too? Not really, no. No, there's no I shelf bought life. Tiger shellac flakes from uh, Woodcraft, and I could not get those to dissolve. It just turned Some won't, them. some won't, depending on the concentration of the flax. Depending on if you've had it overnight, because even when we did it for the doctor, he ended up, we put six coats of shellac over this clock in the final one, and he had still a lot of the flax on the bottom. It did, and he had dissolved it for at least 24 hours. If you let it sit for a real long time, but we decanted it out. You don't have that sludge. I always filter everything. It's worth the little paint screen filter, the medium to fine mesh. If I'm putting lacquer in the gun or polyurethane, even if I'm doing it by brush, if I use polyurethane and I'm doing my brush, one direction with the grain, do not go back.